Anyone who's looked over the universe I created for hyperspace is aware that I make really weird and quirky aliens. These do not look like the aliens in many other sources, science, movies, TV shows. For one thing, my aliens are almost never humanoid. Now, when I was working at Chaosium, a guy came by with his suggested game, uh, Other Suns, which we did not publish. It eventually got published, just, you know, not by us. But... Um, I read it and he had aliens and his al he had aliens that were based on foxes, two different kind of aliens based on cats, aliens based on bears, aliens based on weasels, like all kinds of cute furry aliens that were humanoids. You know, this is before furries were a thing. I don't know if the author was into furries. I doubt it. He just said he liked cute animal aliens. So I was looking at these and I said, these, I mean, I noticed that, that all your aliens look like furry animals from Earth. This seems unlikely to me. Why would Earth carnivora specifically be the basis for all their alien life? Why won't she have other kind of other things? And he answered in a way that made me really angry. He said, well, you just don't have enough imagination to think of things like this. And I was like, what? So I uh, am not too proud to say that I helped veto that being published by Chaosium because that offended me so much because I did not think I lacked imagination because I can envision things beyond space dogs, you know? Anyway, if you like other suns or furries, that's okay with me. I just didn't think that's what aliens should look like. So the question is, what is a humanoid? There's lots of humanoid looking aliens in movies and TV. There's two good reasons for this. First, humanoids are cheap. Just glue a crinkle cut french fry to a guy's nose and presto, you have an alien. Second, it's easy to make humanoids understandable. If you want a nice alien, this is helpful. If he looks kind of humanish, like a blue girl famously used in a lot of things, then you can kind of sympathize and understand the alien. It's not necessary though. If you've seen the great South African film District 9, the, the good guys are hideous shrimp-like monsters. By the end of the movie, you're completely identifying with them, but they are not humanoid particularly. Now to summarize, humans like Yoda are easier for us to understand and emote with. Here's the case of two. In the case of Yoda, we're supposed to like him. In the case of the Santaran, we're supposed to hate him. If these creatures looked like a spider or a fish, all their emotions would have to be transmitted through actions only. Neither Yoda nor the Santaran really have very expressive faces, they're just rubber masks. But the expression is actually molded into the face. And of course, the idea that an alien would have the same expression as a human is kind of bogus too, but let's go on to something more in that depth background. How common are humanoids? First, let's figure out what exactly is humanoid. In some of my dad's old science fiction books, they defined humanoid as looking exactly the same as a human. In this book, an alien that had cat ears and whiskers wasn't humanoid. Now, I'm gonna use a more generous definition. To me, a humanoid is a biped that stands erect with two arms and a head on top. It might have a tail, you know, it might have a weird head, you know, that's pretty loose. So on Earth, going to the basic of this, which is bipedalism, it's more than that, but to go to the biped, how many bipeds do we have on Earth? The answer that is in all the history of, of life on Earth, there have been exactly two groups of animals that evolved bipedalism. One of them were the archosaurs. They evolved it several times. Now, archosaurs include a bunch of distinct groups, including dinosaurs. Here is two different bipedal dinosaurs. They're from different groups. One's a plant eater, one's a meat eater, but they're both bipedal and they're both archosaurs. There's living archosaurs. Crocodiles and alligators are one of the group of living archosaurs. Now, no crocodile today is bipedal, but here's pictures of a couple of extinct ones that might have walked on their hind legs part of the time. You can see that they're not very bipedal and mostly probably went at all fours. I mean, a bear can rear up on his hind legs, but it's not a biped, you know? Uh, my dog goes up on her hind legs when I give her a treat. She's not a biped. The other famous bipedal archosaurs are birds. But I'm not sure birds really count as bipeds. I mean, yes, they have two legs. But for many birds, the legs are more about landing gear, you know, or they use to manipulate things like with a parrot. They aren't really the same as our legs. They're almost like more like an arm you can walk on. And now for some birds, they are the bird's main movement system, like with chickens or flightless birds. But 
None of these archosaurs, dinosaurs or birds, are humanoid, except in the loosest sense. I mean, <laughs> their bodies are a lot different from ours. <clears throat> their leg structure is a lot different from ours. I mean, bipedal dinosaurs have nearly horizontal bodies <clears throat> with the tail stretched out behind. We don't. Birds don't even have arms. I think it makes, takes more than two legs and a head to be a humanoid. You couldn't mistake any of these other bipeds for a human in a dark alley. You may remember back when I said that two groups of animals that involve bipedalism. Well, behind the archosaurs, the other group of animals that involve bipedalisms is, you know, us. Here, me. I'm a biped. At one time, there was other humanoid species that were also bipedal. Neanderthal, hobbits, Homo erectus, Australopithecus, and so on. All the others are extinct. We're still plodding along, but no other mammal is bipedal. What's that you say? What about apes? Well, in the first place, apes are close relatives. They don't really count as a separate group. In the second place, you can see they're not actually bipeds. Yeah, they can rear up and walk on their hind legs, but they're not bipeds. That's not how they travel. There is one exception. Gibbons actually do walk on their hind legs when they can't use their arms to get around. But their hind legs are short and weak and not really very good for walking. If you ever get a chance to check out the gibbon exhibit at a zoo, watch it for a while. The way these guys zoom around on their arms is amazing. And it's just about a different way of moving from us, as you can imagine. So bipeds are restricted to two groups, one of them us. For most kinds of animal life, the number of legs isn't even a consideration. Here's six animals that are not closely related. None of them have the slightest touch of humanoidism about them. In all the past billion years of evolution, not once has a humanoid evolved. Okay, once, but only once. I realized this even as a kid growing up. I knew you didn't have to be shaped like a human to be smart. I knew octopuses were smart. I read books about them. I knew jaybirds were smart. I read about them. I knew my cat was pretty smart. Not, you know, up to my level, but it's easy to imagine a cat involving intelligence. Dolphins are smart too. While insects aren't smart, it's easy to imagine an ant or a wasp colony evolving to intelligence someday. So any intelligent beings out there should take on a myriad of shapes. None of these shapes would be anything like us and probably not like anything on Earth. Maybe some shapes are more or less universal due to parallel evolution, but parallel evolution works when there's a constraint in the environment, not just for fun. Let me give you some examples. This is a worm snake. It's shaped like a worm because it lives in the same place as worms, burrowing underground. Kind of ironic because of course it eats worms. So do all burrowing things have this shape? No, there's lots of burrowing things that aren't shaped like worms, as you can see. Sometimes, and I've read this more than once, scientists explain that fish and squid look similar because they live in the water, they're fast swimmers. That's true, but it doesn't tell the whole story. After all, here's a fish and a squid, and they live in the water, but man alive, they do not look anything alike or like the other ones. Also, squid can be really, really easy to tell apart from fish. Even if some part of them is sort of torpedo shaped, parallel evolution didn't really make them very similar. Now, living in land has challenges. It's a constrained environment, but the only parallel evolution we have with other land animals is not our shape, it's that we can breathe air and we have exteriors that don't dry out. A pill bug, a human and a snail all live on land, but we have not evolved to look the same. I would expect an alien that lived on land in an atmosphere to breathe air like us and to have a water resistant exterior like us, at least if they're water based. But I wouldn't expect the creature to look like us any more than a praying mantis does. And in fact, I wouldn't expect a praying mantis either. You see, a praying mantis is much more closely related to us than any alien life form would ever be. So I grew up on Star Trek. There's Mr. Spock. I love Mr. Spock. He's completely impossible. Now, if you didn't have a classical education, you may not realize, no, that he is supposed to be a hybrid between an alien from planet Vulcan and a human. Even if somehow beings evolved on Vulcan, that looked like humans, they couldn't reproduce with us. Seriously, a carrot is far more closely related to humans than a Vulcan would ever be. And we can't hybridize with carrots. Honest. For one thing, aliens might have not have DNA. And if they did, it might not work the same way with the same phosphate sugar chains and bases. There are theoretically millions of possible nucleotides that could be used to code genetic material. Earth life uses four. So if a DNA-based alien had five nucleotides, or six, or 50, even with powerful genetic tools, we couldn't hybridize. And if they also happen to have just four, there's no reason they'd be the same four. So I'm sorry, Mr. Spock. 
I love you, but you're not a possible thing. Unless, perhaps, somehow, Vulcans are related to Earth life somehow, maybe via panspermia? But anyway, moving on. So the blockages I'm talking about here only apply if the alien has DNA. There's no reason that an alien's genetic code would be DNA. A genetic code has to be complicated, so you can have a variety of things. It has to be reproducible. Before DNA was discovered here on Earth, our scientists were certain that a protein was the genetic code. Proteins can form huge chains. They have really complicated structure. They're natural for coding. We didn't use that, but we could have. This is life as we know it. But we only have one example of life here on Earth. Our life on Earth. Life as we know it might exist on a planet like Jupiter. See these big floating blimp-like things? But even these are made a little bit human-centric. Why would they have two eyes on top? Why not a ring of eyes around the mouth? Why does it need eyes anyway? To find another member of its species? One eye might be enough for that, or put eyes all over it. You see the issues we deal with thinking about life in other worlds. Here Mr. Darling is trying to make an alien-looking life form, but he still is constrained by what he knows. This is life as we know it. Still, what about life not as we know it? Life based on crystals, or super strings, or heavy metals, or made of gas like Fred Hoyle's Black Cloud. It's a book, The Black Cloud. Or any number of other possibilities. We can't necessarily imagine what's out there. Worried about if they're humanoid is just scratching the surface. They could be fundamentally, utterly different from us from inside out. The alien species that you've been seeing turntables of here are from my hyperspace game. I feel I really stretched my imagination to create them, but ultimately they're still limited by my imagination and my creativity. Nothing is more certain than the fact that alien life will be even more varied than this. Let me give you a good example from a science author I love, Stephen Jay Gold. Now, when Pioneer 11 was sent on his mission, Mr. Gold wrote a lengthy article, which I read. In it, he said, We know exactly what we will find on the moons of Jupiter. All the moons will be airless rocks, cratered, just like Earth moon, Earth's moon. There will be glorious, gray, dead sameness forever, because the laws of nature do not change. So all the worlds beyond and all the moons will look just like this, with no variation. But when Pioneer got out there and photographed the moons in 1979, this is what we got instead of the glorious gray dead sameness. These moons weren't gray or dead. They were bizarre and unique. Europa's surface is the most active landscape in the whole solar system. It jets enormous plumes in the air like geysers. Enceladus is totally covered with fresh clean ice, making it super bright and white and pure looking. Io is the most volcanically active body we know of, with giant sulfur volcanoes. Ganymede is a moon with a magnetic core and field. It has a liquid ocean under the ice, making it a possible habitat for life as we know it. The moons were crazy. Every moon was different in structure and makeup, and they looked different. Even the gray dead moons, like Mimas, have interesting bits. Look at Mimas. Sometimes people like to call it the Death Star, but I don't think that's what it looks like at all. I think it's Groth. The Harbinger. Okay, so that was a close call. I guess Groth isn't ready to awaken yet. Anyway, after Pioneer 11, Stephen Jay Gold had to go back and write a retraction of what he'd originally said. He had the good grace to admit that, in fact, he was thrilled by the fact that space was far more weird and varied than he had any idea at all, and that this was great. He loved it that everything would be different. So if we went to another, another galaxy, another planet system, everything would be totally bizarre and new. There'd be nothing like we have here. Why am I bringing this up? Because anything is possible. Our astronomers have found a planet that's full of sulfuric acid. They have found a planet that has only ocean and no land. They have found a planet whose entire surface is covered with a crust of diamond. A planet that rains rubies and sapphires. A planet that has the total density of a cork. And several planets which are similar to Earth. I see no reason to dismiss any of these as a possible habitat for life. Could life evolve on the planet that blows shards of glass at hundreds of miles per hour across the surface? Sure, why not? Had to be really different from us. I guess the life would have to be burrowing or armored or flying along with the glass shards. What I'm trying to say is that the universe is wild, weird, wonderful, and has endless variety. We can never expect to meet beings that look anything like us. This makes us, the humans, precious and rare. So let's watch over one another. <laughs>